All right, we are live and we already have five guests, which is amazing. Uh, so hello everyone and welcome. Thank you for joining us. Hi, MJ. Hi. Thanks so much for being here today. Um, so my name is Sophia. I'll be behind the scenes today um, as our wonderful, amazing and talented guest, MJ, uh, takes us through her program called Core Traditions. Um, this program is made possible in part through Heart and Soul Fund by EPCOR. Uh, to learn more about their uh, Heart and Soul Fund, visit uh, epcor.com slash heart and soul fund. Um, so I'm just gonna share a little bit about MJ um, and then I'll run into some housekeeping here and most recently served as indigenous art consultant for Fort Edmonton Park and indigenous curator for the Edmonton Public Library. In 2019, MJ served as an Indigenous artist in residency and always has about 5 million things on the go. Um, it's, uh, it's I, I get to work with her in other places um, other than this building, which we are both in. So MJ is in the Borealis room at the art gallery and I am in one of the offices just so that we can keep each other safe uh, and go maskless. Um, a few housekeeping notes. Uh, so if you are noticing things are getting a little bit fuzzy, uh, hit that reconnect button at, the, button at the top of your screen and that'll just uh, refresh everything right into back into this room. Uh, there's also a chat function, so uh, feel free to ask any questions. If I don't know the answer and I think it's, I would love to know the answer, we might pop in and ask MJ. And if not, uh, we can follow up with you afterwards. We'll download the chat and make sure we get uh, get those questions answered. Um, as well, this is, if you can't join us live today, um, don't worry, uh, we will be uploading this to our YouTube channel. So the Art Gallery of Alberta has a YouTube channel and all of our past live AGA or AGA lives are on there, um, as well all of our upcoming ones, uh, including this one. Uh, so make sure you do check that out. But that's enough of me talking because mm -hmm. MJ is quite, as you can see, with all of the amazing items on the table, she's got a lot to cover. Um, so please, MJ, take it away. And I look, I so look forward to learning a traditions. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. And thank you for that introduction. Um, it is a busy time. I'm, I'm very involved with all kinds of things, but um, it is a passion and I, I love it. And it's, it's a wonderful time to to be alive. Um, although we're, we're struggling a little bit, we do have to deal with COVID and um, keeping ourselves safe. So please do. And I hope that um, you can sort of follow along with what I'm doing. And again, if there's questions, please feel free to ask me anything you'd like. mentioned, I am a mixed heritage. I am Cree, Mohawk and French. That's my Métis mix. Uh, my family is from Lac Saint Anne uh, and the Michelle band. So that's um, my roots. I wasn't raised out there, I was raised all over Alberta, but um, but this is home. I was born here, uh, definitely my home and, and native land, uh, you could say. So um, <clears throat> one of the, the wonderful techniques that I was able to learn is, and um, please correct me for those Cree speakers out there uh, to uh, make sure that I have that right for the next time. <laughs> so, um, but the porcupine was, uh, an animal that wasn't fast moving, so it was easy to capture. They made a, a succulent meal, and then all the quills were used as adornment and decoration. So um, it's it's part of the rodent family. It, uh, it's the second largest rodent, actually. Um, first would be the, the porcupine, that's the, the largest. And it habits uh, woodlands, uh, mostly woodland area in Canada. And it's primarily uh, a nocturnal animal. Uh, you'll find it climbing and, and resting in a tree branch uh, during the day or under and under a, a burrow. Um, and it's, uh, let me just, oh, sorry, lost my spot here. Um, <clears throat> yeah, and also, sorry, um, the <clears throat> porcupine quills were also, there was some suggestion that the quills themselves were part of a trade. So it was um, used as, served as a medium of exchange uh, during uh, pre-contact and, and with indigenous trade. And so those people who don't have the porcupine in their neck of the woods, so to speak, that uh, they were able to trade for them. 
The porcupine actually, an adult size porcupine, will average between 30 and 40,000 quills. But there's um, all kinds of sizes all over the, the body. Um, on the tail quills, you'll get these really heavy ones. I'm not sure where to go here for this. They're so they, I don't know if you can see that, but they're quite large. Those are quite heavy, and those are towards the tail end of the, the animal. Um, whereas these ones are quite fine. And these are more um, closer to the belly, side belly uh, quills. So, and then they range um, from the belly to the back. They get a little thicker as they go around the body. And the ones that I like to use are the side quills. Sometimes the, the um, depending on what I'm doing actually too, but I do like the side quills mostly, uh, sometimes closer to the belly. But when you get right into the center of the animal, there really isn't uh, any quills. There's, it's, there's hair. Uh, and quills actually are a type of hair. It's an extension. It just becomes hard because they're, they grow with the barbs on the end. That is their protection. They don't uh, shoot the quills like some people believe. That's an old wise tale. Um, but the, they will swish their tail um, if they, in defense, and they, they kind of stand up their quills like hackles, I guess. And that is their protection. So anything that touches them will get jabbed and poked. And they do hurt. <laughs> They're not very nice. Anyone who's had a dog that's chased them and, and bit them, your, uh, these quill earrings I made, these are more like a back quill. They're not as heavy as these ones. But um, though it was easier, quill work still survived. It almost died out. You could, in some ways, it sorted for size and then died. Um, vegetable dyes, natural dyes, roots were used, bark was used. Um, but they always used a mordant to secure the, the color, to make the color stay. And often that was an acidic um, type of a medium. Um, in fact, some, some peoples would collect uh, urine from children just so that they could use that um, to set the dye in the quills. <clears throat> um, but anything acidic, uh, vinegar works. Uh, that's what I've used before in... Um, with my classes that I've been teaching. So <clears throat> some of the tools that were used um, a long time ago would have been sinew for sewing them down, a bone, a bone flattener to flatten the quills. Um, <clears throat> a knife was used to cut the quills. I don't have my knife with me, but I do have these handy dandy little scissors. I really like them. They're nice little shears or snips. They work really well. And I have also another little pair, but I do also yeah. use an X-Acto blade, <clears throat> and that's also helpful in some, for some, um, some instances where you need to cut the quill from the hide. Um, for, it's best to work on natural smoked hide. Um, smoked hide is, um, is uh, like a thick flannel when it's done. So you can sort of see the thickness in it um, that, I'm not sure where that is exactly if you can see that, but it's quite thick. So you can actually sew kind of in between the, the layer so that you can hide all your stitches and you don't have anything in the back. So this one is, I have my thread showing, but there's no, just because I had to put my, my um, needles in the back just to get them out of the way, but there's no, loose ends, no loose threads, because I was able to go into the hide and tie the knot and hide that thread inside the, the hide itself. So I'm using um, moose hide here. And um, when I begin, I always chart off my design. I graft it out. And this is what I've come up with. It's my own design, but it's um, kind of just reflective, I think, a little bit of, of my, my cultural heritage. And, and so then I found this stuff. You might want to try and see if you can find this yourself and see if you like it. Some people don't really care for it, but I, I'm trying it out. It's not too bad. It's a thin film where it, it, um, it's actually water soluble, which is kind of neat. It works really great for beadwork as well. <clears throat> so I've traced my design on it and then gently sort of stores. And it is a um, permanent pen. It's got a very fine tip. I can draw a line. I don't get run too thickly into the hide because you don't want them, them to blob onto the... So I, I brought one of my um, quill pieces to show you. And this is quill sewing. 
And you can see that without the reflection. I love these lights, by the way. I have some color in my face today from the lights. That's awesome. Um, but this is an example and kind of a sampling of different styles of, of quill work. And there is a zigzag stitch, which is in the center of the little buds there. And I don't know if that's where you can see it the best, but, um, and that's kind of the easier stitch to learn. The zigzag stitch is one of the first ones you would learn. If you want to practice, practice using ribbon. That's what I get the fine ribbon that works really well. Or somebody told me that they tried it with, um, with straws that they just cut the straws cause it's thin and flat and, and then they can fold it. So you can try that too, if you'd like. <clears throat> The other stitches that are here are the line stitch. That's these little blue swirls here. And then there's another stitch called the zigz or sawtooth stitch. And that's kind of fun as well. So I was going to work on the line stitch that I have here on my piece that I started. Uh, but because my quill has been sitting a little bit longer, um, it dried out. I have to moisten it. And you have to keep them moist. Um, <clears throat> and so I have my little bowl of water with my quills in it. And um, and so that they've been soaking for a little while. Warm, lukewarm water is good. You don't really want to have hot water because they'll soften too fast. And then if the quill itself actually isn't hollow, um, as some people believe that it is, it's not hollow. It has like this little foamy core to it. And if you let it soak too long, you'll squish all that core out uh, that foamy core. I'm not sure what it's called scientifically, but it um, if it does come out, it um, it won't. Your quill won't flatten because it needs that um, that uh, foam to flatten and stick to itself, so that uh, you can manipulate the quill and, and and bend it and fold it. If, like I said, if you if you leave it in the water too long it will squish out and, and then it just is a hollow tube that just wants to stay um, um, kind of open and, and that doesn't, it, um, it doesn't work very well anyways. So <clears throat> these are not too, too bad, but what I'm gonna have to do is, excuse me here, but I'm gonna have to put this in my mouth. And a long time ago, um, <clears throat> elders and, and those uh, that did quill work uh, did put the quill in the, their mouths to soften it. I don't really recommend that if you're going to be dyeing your quills different colors um, with writ clothing dye. I don't think it's really healthy for you to have that in your mouth. Plus, you have to be careful that uh, the quill isn't pointing the wrong direction so that you would not want to get that stuck in your mouth at all. And <clears throat> it is really awful if, if that happens. I actually did that one time. I was in a hurry and I... I kind of coughed or something, and I had the quill on the side of my mouth, but it kind of got stuck. It was just awful. <laughs> it was just a terrible experience, so please don't do that. Uh, if you're, um, some older ones will, if they've done quill work for a long, long time, then they're they're efficient and they can manage that quill, but I, I prefer not to myself. But they did actually would pull the, the quill out of their mouth and flatten it between their teeth, and that's something that also is interesting. And they say that saliva is better than soaking it in water. But um, you can try, but just be very cautious. You don't want to get that stuck in your, your mouth. It's, it's not pleasant. Believe me. Trust me. <laughs> so, um, <clears throat> so a few other things, though, with, um, with the quills and, and the stories behind the quill work. There's a, an ancient... Uh, or sorry, there's well, and it's an it's an ancient art form, and um, the the Blackfoot believe that it was the thunder spirit that gave the first uh, porcupines to the ancestors who taught them how to do quill work. Um, I, I always find it really interesting to to hear those stories or to learn about the origins of things, and and how it was uh, given to the people. Among the Sioux, Sioux were really well known for their quill work. Um, there's a legend of a young woman <clears throat> who was taught in her dream how to do porcupine quill work and how to work with them. And then when she woke up, she turned around and taught this to, to others. Um, there's also another Sioux story that talks about an old, an old woman who 
who continuously does quill work. Uh, and she has her dog that lays beside her as she does her quilling. And then when she falls asleep, her dog um, chews up her, or tears up her quill work and she has to start over. And so this is a continuous thing and it's ongoing. But they say that the belief is that if she actually were to finish her quill work, that it would signify the end of the world. So um, so that I think is a, an interesting uh, story uh, or belief that is um, maybe it's prompting us to keep keep this work going and not to stop and to and to not let it die out completely because we want to we want to be able to keep this um, this incredible um, art form alive <clears throat> so I'm gonna actually close that because I don't think I need that anymore it's distracting anyway so um, <clears throat> But I'm going to actually move this over so that I can pull the stuff around here and you can see my work a little bit clearer and closer. I'll move this here so that these are out of the way. I'm going to be working on the green one. Like I said, I'm going to be doing the, um, the lined work here. So. And as I mentioned, I'm not going to be using sinew. I have in the past used a little bit, but it's a little tricky to, to make a sinew thread. Um, I have my late elder Elsie Quintel um, from Square Lake up past Lac La Biche actually taught me how. Um, once these are dry, you take little strips, you rub it in your mouth, the, the sinew, and then you roll it uh, on, your hand, on your leg or whatever is comfortable to to make a twist and to create the sinew. Um, a long time ago, they would use awls. I don't have a bone awl, but I have a little metal awl that has a little piece of antler on the, on the end of it. And these would go into the hide, would poke a hole into the hide. And then the sinew, um, you could twist the sinew to an, and make a, a point uh, at, the, at the end, like at the tip of it, and let it dry. And then it comes firm and solid again. And then once you poke the hole in the hide, then you would thread the sinew in without a needle. You don't need a needle because it's it's that stiff uh, and very, very strong. Sinew is incredibly strong. Um, El the elder, Elsie, late elder, Elsie Quintel, actually still, um, she beaded regularly and she still used sinew to do the outside edge of her um, of her designs, always with sinew because it's just really strong and, and and you don't have to worry about it rubbing and, and uh, the thread breaking at all. So, <clears throat> but if you know any hunters, you can get the tendons from the backbone and you want to try it, you can. Um, there's a casing on the outside. I actually have a piece here, so <laughs> you can peel that off. You can do it while it's wet or you can wait till it's dry. And um, you can give, your, give it a try if you want to. Um, or call me if you need need to if you're trying it out to see how it works. That that work that's okay too. Uh, or message me. So, um, but so some of the things that I have practiced with and used, I have used beading thread, and this is just a nylon beading thread. Uh, you have to wax it up really really well if you're going to um, use the the, the nylon thread uh, it, because it is strong. Um, but without the, um, the wax on it, it's too slippery. Um, it doesn't hold the stitch in place, and that's what you want it to do. It kind of mimics sinew in a sense because of the wax on it, and, and it is fairly strong. Um, I, I like it in some ways. Uh, it, does, it does stitch pretty good, but it can actually tear your, um, your quill. So you have to sort of be careful with it too because uh, if you pull too tight, it actually can break your quill. So you have to just be careful. I also started using um, a, like a cotton thread. This is a, a nice heavy cotton thread. But again, I wax it up really, really well when I'm going to use it. And um, <clears throat> I can just show you quickly here. I think there's one of these. So when I do my waxing, I take... I take, um, I like to have a comfortable amount of thread, about a wingspan, that's what I call it, a wingspan of thread, that's that's plenty. You can go a little bit more, but if you have too much, then it's it makes it kind of 
awkward because you're pulling and pulling all the thread and it it'll start to fray on you and it'll it'll get all bunched up and you it's better just to take just enough that's comfortable to use at one time this is beeswax and i bought this a chunk of beeswax a brick of it from the farmer's market and i melted it down and i just put it in um, ice cube trays and made myself uh, some beeswax um, so that i can carry it around and i, I give them to, to friends who are learning cool work and uh, or bead work but you have to wax it up pretty good i like to rub it through at least three or four times so that it gets a good coating on there and that's what you want it to do so just um, pull it through the wax and the wax takes the tangle out of the thread it preserves the thread because it coats it it makes the stitch stay in place it's really actually um, um, something really valuable and I always recommend it don't don't forget your wax always wax your thread it's really important and then <clears throat> when I thread my needle I always pinch it between my fingers and I place the uh, the the needle onto the the thread um, it's a little easier it always seems to work out uh, because you're squeezing it flat and you're just opening it enough to go through the eye of the needle and it seems to work pretty good usually there you go so it's it does seem to work a little bit better than trying to poke the thread through you know because that's a flexible you know it's it's wiggly and it's harder to um, to put into the eye of the needle. So that's what I found and uh, give it a try. See if that works for you. So there's my, I'm gonna uh, just do this single thread. This is a fairly heavy, heavy thread. So I'm not gonna double this. Um, if you feel that you need to or want to, you can double it with, if you have a thinner thread, but I, I wouldn't recommend it. You, would, you don't have to. Uh, single thread seems to work good with the nylon and with this cotton thread that I'm trying out. And I, I, I do like it. I'm going to put this one over here because I already have the one started here. And so I actually put on this one just so that it, um, to kind of um, get the process going here, I have a knot and a tail end at the back side of, the, of my leather and my hide. And I like to leave a long tail end with one little knot. It doesn't have to be double knotted because you're gonna go back into the, the leather right close to the knot and pull the knot inside and hide your knot. And then you can actually go back and forth with, the, with your uh, needle to hide that thread and it actually secures it. So that's why I've left a long tail end at the back. And that's what I'm gonna do. So I'm gonna have to put this in my mouth for just a minute here, so I'm sorry about that. Um, I should have softened it earlier. Mm. Hopefully this won't take too long to soften it. And you can see what I'm doing. I just got the quill in my mouth. I normally don't do this because it is, like I said, it's got it's rich clothing dye. Um, I don't use the natural dyes because it's a big process to go and collect and harvest all your natural ingredients um, to do the dyeing process. So I find it easier to just use rich clothing dye. And it does have nice, brilliant colors, nice and vibrant colors uh, that I like. Um, <clears throat> I have been trying to source out. Somebody told me that there was some um, uh, online you can find natural dyes that somebody actually is creating. So um, give them a try. I think um, I haven't myself yet, but I, I, I do I do want to. Uh, but I think it would uh, be a nice um, a nice uh, change to the the colors of the of the quills when they're finished. I'm going to just try and soften this a little bit more. And um, if there's any questions at this point, <laughs> please let me ask those questions while I'm, I am trying to soften this, this uh, quill in my mouth. Um, <clears throat> it'd be nice to know if there's other quill workers out there uh, working on, on quills. And um, where I usually harvest my quills is, is roadkill. I usually have a lot of friends that will call me after they, they pass a, a, a porcupine on the road. And they always call me. And I love that they think of me when it comes to ro roadkill. So, um, but I'll, I'll get a call, you know, it, you know, once a year at least that, you know, somebody's found a, a porcupine on the side of the road and they tell me about it and where to go and how to find it. So, um, 
If, yeah, so that's that's where I find my quills. You can um, actually take quills off of uh, live animals with a blanket, um, which which works. Uh, but you're not going to be. You, there's no selection then because you're just going to get my, more or less the back quills, uh, maybe the tw tail quills as well. Hi, MJ. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> we do have one question. Mm -hmm. We have a question from Elaine. Uh, they write, what size needle is recommended? Mm. Well, I use a sharp. Um, these ones, it's, uh, these are a number 10. They're, they're not too bad. The eye is a little bit small, so you might want to find a, a sharp that has a larger eye just so that it's easier to thread. These aren't too bad, but um, they're good with the nylon thread, but not so good with the, the cotton thread that I'm using. So just a regular sharp um, size 10 works uh, with a nice eye. Those are good. I like those ones. They seem to work pretty good. Good question because I forgot that one. Mm -hmm. It's starting to soften. <laughs> it's getting there. Okay, I'll see if that works. So I'm, on, I'm not sure which camera to use so that I can show you my, the stitch that I'm going to be doing. So this is an interesting stitch that you, uh, it's kind of a back stitch, but you have to wrap around the quill. So for this line stitch, what you're doing is you're going around the quill sort of once and then kind of again, just sort of halfway. So it looks like, I don't know if you can see that, it's kind of tiny. And then you're gonna take a stitch. Oops, see, that's what happens comes off and the stitch is just like it's kind of a back stitch yeah this is a, just a little awkward sorry about that and I just want to I'll get one going here and then and then hopefully I can I don't know which camera to use to get close And then what happens is once, because you're pulling it, it has this little twist in it, in a sense, it pulls the quill down and sort of hides the, hides the thread. And it might be hard to see because it is pretty tiny, um, but I'll, go, I'll do a few more. So, oh, I wanted to show you my, my few books. I, I love to find books on, on, um, on quill work. I couldn't bring all of my, my library here because it would have been pretty heavy. So I, I only brought a couple, but I really do recommend, here, I'll show you them. I recommend this one. I think they sell this one at um, Halford Hyde. And it is pretty good because it's a cooler companion, it's called. And it's really good with the illustrations. So I'll actually just show you the one that I'm working on here, see if that helps. Maybe it'll, it'll help a little bit, but so this is a single thread line technique, and it gives a really great illustration of how to do it. So it's um, pretty clear in the instructions, and that's what's really nice about this book. So when I was working at the college, we, we were able to get uh, books for everybody to use, and this is the one uh, that, um, uh, that we used. And it's um, Eagles, Eagles View Publishing, if that helps at all. But I do believe they sell them at um, Halford Hyde. <clears throat> the other one that I really like because it kind of gives a nice brief overview of the history of the quill work, and this is this is from the Glenbow Museum, and it is uh, Quill Works of the Plains. So it's a really nice book. There's all kinds of different quill work. The one that I really wanted to show you um, is the quill plating. It's called, and it's usually done on on pipe stems. And this is a close-up shot here of it. It's just beautiful. So it wasn't sewn down onto the, the pipe stem, but it actually was wrapped around it. It was, it's kind of like a braiding almost uh, to do this one. So camera, camera angle. <laughs> this is really different. Anyway, so yeah, this is this is really great just so you can see those close-up shots and it's, it's really awesome that way. Um, there's so many different styles of quill work. Um, there's the sewn, the weaving, the wrapping, and the plating. Those are the four main um, types of, of quill work. And so um, this one here is, this is a beautiful bag. This is uh, to cover a, um, 
believe it's, um, yeah, cradle board cover is what it is. But it's quite lovely. This is all a band stitch. This is a tricky one. This is a harder stitch to learn. Um, but it's, it is just amazing when you, when you actually complete it. On the bottom of this bag here, this is called wrapping. So it's wrapping on rawhide. You can also yeah, uh, wrap um, leather, like leather thongs. That's this one here. So there's one that's all wrapped. Uh, this is also wrapped here with, with just a quills all along on top of it as well. So um, the four I said, again, were there's quill plating, wrapping, sewing, and weaving. And so this is just sewing. This is a line stitch, as I said. Um, and maybe, I don't know if I could, if it's possible, but um, I, and maybe there's a screenshot we can take of this afterwards and put it on so that you can see that the illustration. Uh, but I mean, the books aren't too expensive. You could always go to, like I said, go pick one up at Halford Hyde if you're in the city. Um, and it, it is great for the illustrations. So, but perhaps I can, um, I can get, I can get um, Sophia to help me and we can maybe print this or post it also with when we're complete uh, for today. And then you can have that with you. So, or take that with you as well. Anyways, so let's get back to it. And it's probably dried a little bit. So I'm going to have to try and do this again. Sorry. Um, and that's the tricky part about doing quills. You have to be steady with it because you have to keep them moist enough so that um, it's not going to work too much. Um, to keep them flexible is what you want because they do soften up enough so that you can flatten them. Uh, with the line stitch, I, I don't usually. I do cut off the tip, though, but I don't flatten them because you want to keep that little bit of... Um, um, keep the... Um, a little bump in it because it... Uh, oops, there we go. <clears throat> It'll kind of raises that stitch as you're going, so it has a little bit of a, um, a hump to it, I guess you could say. Uh, okay. So again, you're just going to go around the quill. It's kind of like once and a half around, so it's not completely. And, and then you just make a little tiny stitch beside it and in front of the stitch, so halfway past the other stitch. I hope that makes sense. Um, And that happens sometimes where it kind of gets stuck. But you can pull it forward and you can see it as it tucks itself in. It might be really hard to see uh, from where you are because it's really, really quite tiny here. But you'll know you know what I mean when I when I'm when you if you try it, I give it a try. Uh, like I said, I'm available if somebody is trying it out and, and they want to um, to give it a try and they're stuck on something, then yeah, please feel free uh, to message me and maybe we can put that at the end of the video as well so that uh, you can also contact me if you're if you're stuck, if you're giving it a try and it's, it's tricky. Because there's a lot to it. Um, <clears throat> I seem like I'm going too many here, there we go. Okay. Yeah, it's um, now I have to splice in. So these ones will be better because this one's a little stiff and I'm not really happy. I'm going to have to actually take it out and redo it, but that's okay. I'll do it at home. <laughs> so I won't, uh, I won't do that here with you. But when you're going to stitch, splice another one in, <clears throat> you just go along with your stitching. So <clears throat> when you cut your quill, when you take your quill after it's softened, have a piece of paper towel and jab it into the into the into the paper towel. You can use an exacto blade, or I, I just use my little snips here, and I just cut it off and leave the the barbed end into the paper towel. That way, it's not going to fly off and fall on the floor and get stuck in somebody's foot or something like that. Because that you wouldn't want that to happen. Because that would be pretty painful to get uh, that little barbed end in your <clears throat> in your skin. <clears throat> so now. 
with this one that I'm ready to use, I usually use, I usually put it in with the tail end in the root side of it and just kind of put it in alongside. I'm going to pull it tight, tightly down. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> Excuse me. There's my water. Sorry. Just need a little mess. Sorry about that. Be a little shot. <laughs> Okay, so getting back to it here. <clears throat> so I just uh, spliced in a, a quill. Now I'm going to go around it again and do the stitch one more time. And I did a few forward stitches to try and to sort to help that quill along, but it didn't work. So I'm gonna, like I said, I'm going to have to take it apart when I get home. But that's okay. <clears throat> this is a back stitch, and then you have to be careful that it's not too twisted up and and then you'll pull it in and that little tail end will stick out I'll do a few more stitches and then I'll tell you I'll show you how you trim them off okay because you have to do that so kind of once and a half go around it's a little tiny back stitch and then And you just have to be careful that your 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 stitches don't get too um, there we go too tangled. You just have to watch it. That's all. Okay, one more time, one more stitch, and then I'll show you how to to trim those those quills. Okay. Uh, MJ, we just have a question from the audience as well. Yep. Um, of the four techniques, which is the most difficult to learn? Um, hmm. it kind of depends. Uh, I'd say that the most difficult probably is weaving. Uh, weaving is either on a loom or just on, on, uh, on the garment itself. <clears throat> if you're going or the, or whatever you're making, um, because you're using multiple quills and, and so it's a little trickier if you're doing a looming, um, the loomed quill work um, is tricky because you have to have your quills go through all the the warp threads. The weft threads go across, so um, the warp threads are along um, that hold the that are sort of like the stabilizer of the quills. And you have to put um, so if you have four or five quills, <clears throat> however many wide you're having, then you you uh, put your stitch across, the quills have to bend over top of that stitch, then you, you tighten it up really, really tight. Then you um, put another uh, stitch across, then the quills come up and then they go down back and forth like that, but then you have to splice in. And that's what's the tricky part is splicing in because they're only so, so long. <clears throat> that's probably the, the hardest one to learn. Um, cool wrapping is probably the easiest one to learn because you're just, manipulating the quill, you're flattening it and you're wrapping it around and it's just a little tiny way that you twist it around the other quill so that you can keep wrapping. And so that one's a fairly easy one to learn. Um, and then and then I guess the the sewing, the plating isn't too difficult. Uh, you do that on a little loom as well, just using two threads. So that's probably easier too. Um, quill wrapping and plating are fairly easy. And then the, the quill sewing because there's different styles of sewing um, they're a little tricky because you're having to learn <clears throat> all those multiple stitches as I had in my sampler. And, um, but, but like I said, again, it's, it is really therapeutic. It, it really focuses you. It keeps you calm because you have to be really precise with, with each stitch. Okay. Let me just finish this one. Sorry about that. And see if I can get this here and, and, uh, show you how to, trim the the loose ones okay there we go okay so that's way better that's a lot better okay i'll do one more <laughs> and i don't mind this thread it does seem to want to tangle a little bit so i might go with a shorter a shorter amount of uh, thread to work with I, it's not too bad, and see it's come off my quill. 
Let's see if they know where to it. Okay, got it. Okay, nope, not quite. There we go, okay. Not too bad. Those are better than the last one, but that my cool was dry, so it wasn't working quite right. So now, if you're once you're finished, you want to take your X-Acto blade. This is when you actually need a really nice little X-Acto blade. And what you do is, is you're going to take the end of that quill, the little uh, root end or the little pieces that are stuck out, and you grab it and you pull it up against. You don't don't cut into the hide or cut into the quill. You just pull the quill off into the into the um, <clears throat> into the blade. I hope that makes sense. So there's another one here. So you grab it and you pull it up to the against the blade, and that's how you get rid of all those little loose ends. There's another one here. I was probably going to leave them and go back to them. So that's all you do. And that's pretty much it for the line stitch. And that's, um, that one, I like the line stitch. I like how it, um, you can go around the edges of something. I wanted to show you. There is another photograph in here that um, does show that. And I really like it. If I can find it, I thought it. Hmm. Oh, here's the quill, the quill, um, this is what I mean about it's black and white, but you can see the quill uh, loomed work. So each of these little folds here, that's a quill that's been folded. Um, and you can see it on, on the loom itself. This is a really good illustrated book. It has some nice photos and close-ups like that here. So I, I recommend it if you can find something that has really great pictures. It gives you some better idea. But there was another one here I wanted to show you that was also a close-up of the... Um, the line stitch with the zigzagger. Oh, there it is. Yeah. Oh, it didn't show that. Oh, I thought it was. So anyways, this is a zigzag in a floral design. A lot of the quills that are found, uh, the the real old ones, um, a lot of geometrical designs. But um, then they they with more time that came along. This is a tea cozy. Oops, there's my fingers. This is a tea cozy right here. Um, and so it um, it doesn't say who made it. Um, but there was, you know, as time went on, oh, it says a Cree, Cree Métis. And so you can see a lot of curvilinear designs in this, in this illustration here. But beautiful, beautiful works. I thought I had another one here. I wanted to show you that line stitch. It must have been in my other book because I have a few of them. And, uh, yeah, no, not in here. <laughs> I thought it was. Yeah. But, um, yeah. I think we're we're probably getting close to that time. So if there's any questions or any other questions, please please feel free. What time is it now? It's, we've still got about 10 minutes. That's not too bad. So um, yeah, I can probably finish this one, but I think I'm gonna take it apart anyways. Because And that's the thing too, is like you get a little bit fussy because you want it to be just right. And so you want all the stitches to be all the same. And so I, I tend to be a little fussy. I'm going to have to backtrack this one here and the, and the last one and uh, so that I can do this design. And one day I will complete this and it'll be a bag. So that's, uh, that's the idea with this one here. But they were, I mean, cool work was used to embellish all kinds of things. Um, clothing, of course, moccasins, uh, bags of all kinds. So it just depends on what you wanted to put on but I really do highly recommend using um, smoked hide if you can get some uh, if you can make it that's even better um, I forgot to show you my leather thimble this one I do like it's really nice actually I bought this not too too long ago but it's um uh, you could probably make one too but it was handy I, I went and grabbed it because it's just a nice little leather thimble and it's perfect for doing cool work because you're not going through really heavy, you're, surf using, you're usually passing the needle through the surface of the hide. So <clears throat> you don't need a, a heavy duty one. I have another one that's a leather thimble that has a piece of metal here. So if I'm going through moccasins or a couple layers or three layers of hide, you, you want something that uh, you can press pretty good down on and you don't have to worry about it going through the this and, and jabbing your yourself with the needle. So 
I recommend this too. It's awesome. Um, MJ, we do have a question. Mm -hmm. um, how long should the quills soak for? Um, you know, these are nice and spongy now. I would probably, if I was going to sit here for too long, I would probably take them out. And I'd keep them in a bunch because it keeps the moist, they're the moist um, and it keeps them soft for a little bit. So you just kind of have to play with it. You can feel them. They kind of feel squishy, but not like overly squishy. <laughs> so if that makes sense. I'll actually show you one here. This one actually is got some damage to it. So it's soaked up on the inside. And I'll show you what I mean when I flatten the quill. Um, for this stitch that I was doing here for the demo, it's, um, I don't have to flatten it, but I will show you when I flatten the quills what that looks like. So this one here, like I said, it's got some damage, so it's soaked up some water and it might not, uh, it might even break when I, when I flatten it. So again, you always stick it into a paper towel or a Kleenex or something, um, cut that barbed end off. And so now I'm going to flatten it. I usually flatten it from the, the root end of the, the quill to the tip and I have a bone flattener. If you don't have a bone flattener, that's okay. You can use a spoon or you can use a little, I actually got those little um, chopsticks of some sort from the dollar store at one point, and I used that for a little while. It's just a little piece of wooden. It was flat, um, and it worked really good, actually. So, but, um, yeah, it's, um, I'll just put it over here so you can see it. So, and I don't know if it'll come out or not, but... Oh yes, there's a little bit of squishy white stuff coming out. That's because it was it's a damaged quill, and I can see that it's not not too good. So actually, it's not bad. It's holding pretty good. But that's all you do. Um, yeah, some of the stuffing came out. I don't know what they call that. I should find out <laughs> what that the technical term is for the the inside of the quill. But it is like a little foaminess to it. So so these aren't too bad. This is pretty good. I can show you again. So if you want, you can just use an X-Acto blade too. And again, just lay it on the quill and pull up on the quill so you're not cutting down into anything. And the quill barbed end stays in the, um, in the paper towel. And I'll just show you quickly here again. So I just flatten the quill out. It's not too bad. And that's kind of it. Uh, I had. I don't. I, I should have brought me a little piece of rawhide to show you wrapping uh, quickly. But um, but if you can imagine, uh, the quill goes around the hide. I mean, around the strip of rawhide in the back, and then when it comes, you keep wrapping it around. I don't have anything. Sorry, I wasn't thinking about that. Um, and then it would actually fold it back down on itself. And then this one hooks into it on the back side. And then it, it keeps folding. You keep folding it around. And it's, it keeps flattening. So <laughs> I don't think you can see anything like that because it's kind of mangled looking. But that's the idea of it. Um, you kind of see it. <laughs> but... Uh, yeah, that's that's the cool wrapping part. So I think that's about it. I think that's uh, um, it for today. I've covered most everything. Um, just wanted to make sure that you've seen a little bit of that cool work. And again, I just there's so many different stitches to do. So uh, it's it's just good to practice it. it. Just if you want to try, they do. I think they do sell these. At, uh, you can get little tiny containers of quills if you don't want to work with the porcupine because it's it's quite a process you have to what i do is i skin the the porcupine out and i tack it to a big board and i just kind of let it dry because i don't always have time to, to pluck it right away if you can if you can pluck your quills off the porcupine right away it's it's better but if not i tack it to a board and i let it dry and then uh, sometimes i will just shake the board and the quills will come out because they're dry enough or you just have to take your pliers there's long guard hairs uh, that you want to remove. And those are also used for roaches, uh, the headdresses, the, those wonderful um, headdress, roach headdresses. Um, but um, other than that, to remove all the those, there's a really fine, soft down hair um, amongst the quills as well. So you have to sort of work around that. You can take the quills out. If you're going to use the pliers, and I recommend using the pliers, pull in the direction of the hair or the quill. 
you don't want to pull back on it because it cracks and it'll break it and then you have a damaged quill and then it's not easy to use so but give it a try and like i said um if you're curious and i probably am planning hopefully <laughs> to do a quill workshop in the spring so uh keep your ears open for that i'll probably post it on facebook um just under my name it's mj belcourt so um, if you want to friend me, then I'll post. And then if you're interested at that time, uh, come and take my class. And then we'll get a little bit more dirty and, and have a little more fun and, and, and try out a few more stitches. So, um, yeah, so just, just to let you know. MJ, that was amazing. Oh, my gosh, I feel like I learned so much. Oh, yeah, that's cool. <laughs> we also have a comment from the audience. Thank you so much, MJ. Grateful for the teachings you share. Truly, we are so grateful. Thank you for sharing this with us today. Um, I feel, yeah, I, I feel like we can go into the next really busy week. Um, I know it's a crazy time for for everyone, especially with yesterday's news, but it was so nice to to take a break for a little bit and be able to learn something um, that is rooted with, with such tradition. Um, so thank you, MJ. Um, thank you to our Gallery of Alberta. Um, make sure you check out our AJ Lives coming up in the next month. Um, and then thank you to the Heart and Soul Fund from EPCOR. Mm -hmm. um, hope you have a really great rest of your day, everyone. And um, stay tuned for more on our social media. Thank you, MJ. Thank you. <laughs> Bye, everyone. <laughs>